is ego. The ego and self-centeredness. And now we got this ego. Oh, well, we're going to know everything God knows. We're going to be like God. Uh, so my ego now is born. Ego, self-love, self-centeredness. And if we think about it, Satan says, if you disobey God, you'll become like God. But Adam and Eve should have thought, wait a minute, we're already like God. We're created in his likeness and image. But Satan is offering a counterfeit of what God gave us. And it's important for us to remember this. We've been offered a counterfeit of what God gave us. And because now man has ego, he falls for the counterfeit. And immediately, he's outside of paradise. Because paradise actually is where God and man are in complete communion with each other. That's why St. John Damascene says that the garden was completely filled with light because God was present and the uncreated light of God was there. So paradise is that place where we have full communion with God. So immediately when they <clears throat> disobeyed God and broke their relationship with God, they were outside of paradise. And the next story tells us exactly what happened. Ego, self-centeredness, self-love. Cain and Abel offer their sacrifices, and God accepts Abel's, but doesn't accept Cain's. And then he said to Cain, if you had offered it rightly, I would have accepted. Not if you'd offered the right things, but if you'd offered it rightly. So Cain offered because it was a law, just out of a formalism. Abel offered it from the heart, and therefore it was acceptable, because every offering of the heart is acceptable to God. But to offer something because of the law and not from the heart is not acceptable. So now we begin to see that God isn't demanding simply obedience to a law, but the purification of our hearts, an offering from the heart. But Cain is the oldest. He would inherit anything and be the, the one who had the actual authority. But that isn't enough for him. Abel's off offering is received. And Cain's ego now takes over. His ego and his self-centeredness. Cain, because he offered from the heart, and Abel, uh, Abel offered from the heart, Cain's conscience is burned by the righteousness of Abel. And because of his egotism and self-centeredness, instead of repenting and offering properly, he kills his brother. And this whole sequence now, this shows us what is the real problem of humanity? What causes all of the grief and the sorrow, the war, the murder, the theft, all of the things negative and wicked in humanity come because of our ego, our self-centeredness, and our self-love. And this the story is telling us what is the basic human problem? Why is it that we can't love one another? Why is it that we can't do to others as we want them to do unto us? because of our ego, our self-centeredness, and our self-love. This is everything. This is the root of all the problems. Now we go back to the two trees in paradise, and we see that when man fell from paradise, God made a promise through Eve. He said that uh, the serpent would bruise her off her child's heel, but he would crush the serpent's head. And when we look at the two trees, well, we know that we can't eat an apple or an apricot or a peach and all of a sudden no good from evil. We also know that we can't eat a pomegranate or an apple or something and live have everlasting life. So obviously there's a bigger meaning here. And the first place we see that really fulfilled, remember in the Old Testament how often the sign of the cross is used. When Moses opens the Red Sea and closes it by completing the sign of the cross. Then when they come to the bitter waters of Mara and they have nothing to drink, God tells him to take a branch of a tree with two limbs on it in the form of a cross and throw it into the water. This is the first time we see the blessing of water with a cross, like we do at Theophany, you know, when we bless the water in church. The same thing that Moses did at the bitter waters of Mara. He places the cross, the sign of the cross, in the water, and the water becomes sweet. And then when uh, the Jews come to Rephidim and Amalek is facing them with his army, God tells Moses to stand in the form of a cross. And as long as he stands in the form of a cross, Israel, will, the, the Hebrews will win. 
But when he can't, and he lowers his arms and the cross isn't there, then the Hebrews will lose. So Moses, because his arms get tired, he asks Aaron and Ur to stand and hold his arms up in the sign of a cross. And the Hebrews, of course, win the battle, as long as the sign of the cross is there. But it's kind of nice in Greek because Aaron and Ur is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And uh, even that has some symbolic meaning. <laughs> uh, and we, we see this hint about the sign of the cross. Now, when we see Christ crucified, there's a, a, a murderer on each side. Actually, they were brigands, so they were murderers or some kind, not just thieves. And one on each side of Christ, and really by God's will, because we have a revelation here. One thief reviles Christ. The other thief recognizes Christ as being the good. Not just good, but the good. And for the first time realizes his own evil, his own wickedness. And at that moment, the cross of Jesus Christ becomes the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the cross of Christ is what separates good from evil. It's the, the borderline. And it, because the cross of Christ makes evil clear. And it makes the good clear by what it teaches us. And then when the thief says, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the cross of Jesus Christ becomes the tree of life for him. Because life is from Jesus Christ. Our, our life, our everlasting life, is through Jesus Christ. And on the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ gave us the possibility of everlasting life. He conquered the power of death. And when he rose again, and when we come into the church, when we receive Holy Communion in church, the chalice becomes the tree of life. You know, the altar is a type of paradise. And the tree of life grows in the midst of paradise. That is the chalice when we consecrate it together. We receive our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Communion. Because Jesus Christ is our life, the source of our life, and the one who can give everlasting life. So the, the two trees in the garden are really... A prophecy of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why in so many of the hymns we say that he was hung upon a tree, hung, hung upon the wood. And we refer to the tree several times because the tree of life in the Garden of Eden is the prophecy about the cross of Jesus Christ. And remember also that in the creation it said that darkness was upon the face of the earth. And then he separates light from darkness. And only when the sun can shine on the earth. St. John Chrysostom says the sun was already there, but that the earth was shrouded in a dark cloud. So when, when the cloud was separated so sun could strike the earth, it could bring forth life, because it needed sunshine to bring forth life. And in the beginning, throughout all of our history, throughout the Old Testament, the struggle against idolatry and the coming of Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ is always separating light from darkness and trying to separate light from darkness in the heart of each one of us so that our Lord Jesus Christ gives us the cross itself is the boundary between light and darkness and our Lord Jesus Christ tries to separate that light from darkness within us so that our hearts can be filled with light and that's why he says the, the eye is the window of the soul and if, if, so if it's darkness then it's a great darkness indeed but if it's light then of course it radiates something so our Lord Jesus Christ is throughout all of history separating light from darkness so that it can bring forth the fruit of everlasting life just as the sun brought forth life on the earth, made it possible for things to grow on the earth. And this is the way to read the, the creation narrative because if people argue was it scientifically accurate or not, which is kind of silly because of course it isn't, but they argue it so much that they don't pay attention to the meaning. They pay absolutely no attention at all to what the whole story means. And that's a great loss to us. Because right from the very beginning, we have the prophecy of Christ. We have the, the understanding that paradise is complete communion between God and man. We have the understanding of what genuine love is. And we understand why we've been given freedom. And we understand why... Uh, our, our problem, why we keep falling back into darkness, why we can kill each other, why we can have war, why we can try to build empires and slaughter. See, it's always innocent people who get killed. 
in all of these wars and everything, it's always the innocent who suffer. And even in places like Syria and this sort of thing, it's the innocent villagers, the innocent people in the town who get shot by both sides. They're the ones who suffer. So it's always the innocent who are suffering. And like the holy innocents in Bethlehem and like, a, uh, and like the righteous Abel who was innocent but suffered and was killed. There's always a constant martyrdom. But these things would not happen if man was not consumed by ego, self-centeredness, and self-love. And when our Lord Jesus Christ gave us only four commandments and said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And every one of those, in order to fulfill those four commandments, we have to conquer our ego our self-centeredness, and our self-love. And uh, this is to return us back to paradise. We have to conquer ego, self-centeredness, and self-love. In other words, as Father John Romanetti used to tell us, that the only way to defeat the power of Satan is with unselfish love. Because unselfish love is the opposite of Satan. And he's defeated by it. So if you want to defeat Satan in your own life, and evil in your own life, struggle to acquire unselfish love for other human beings. If we wish to defeat Satan, temptation, and darkness within the parish, or within this community in this case, we have to develop unselfish love within the community. And this pushes Satan back and pushes him out. And in, in, our, in, the, in the greater community, in the larger community, nothing is going to conquer the power of Satan but unselfish love an unselfish love in Christ. And it's only really possible with Christ. So, to have empathy for your neighbor, to love God with all of your being, to have empathy for your neighbor, uh, that is to love your neighbor as yourself, to have love amongst yourselves, to love one another, and to do unto others as you want them to do unto you. You can't do that with ego and self-centeredness and self-love. So that's the great challenge. And it's made clear to us in the very opening part of the book of Genesis, the very opening part of the scripture. The problem is identified and we're told that we have to struggle against it. Now throughout the Hebrew scripture, we see this big struggle with idolatry. The whole Hebrew scripture is about idolatry. Man's struggle with idolatry. The constant struggle with idolatry. And making idols out of almost anything. Uh, it, it, you could make an idol out of the king. And some some places did it. Pharaoh was considered to be a god, so he was an idol. And as soon as the Roman Empire was founded with Augustus Caesar, right after that the Caesars began to declare themselves to be gods. So they created an idol, but they themselves were the idol. So there's a constant struggle with idolatry that goes on in mankind. And we have to remember that the covenant between God and man was never a legal agreement. It was a spousal relationship. And throughout the Old Testament, the prophets always refer to Israel in terms of an unfaithful wife of God. Never as one who broke a contract, never as one who broke a legal agreement, but as an unfaithful spouse. So God is the faithful spouse, and Israel is the unfaithful spouse. But God is always forgiving the spouse, no matter how often she betrays him, no matter how often and the prophets say that she's gone a whoring, that she's given her dowry over to others, uh, that she's become a prostitute, and all of these things. And uh, in order that we understand that, in the, he commands the prophet Osi to go and marry a temple prostitute. Because that's what Israel is now. She's become a temple prostitute. And then when his wife Gomer goes back into prostitution, back into this bondage, God commands him, go and redeem her out. And Ose says, why should I? But for love, what other reason could there possibly be? The same way that I will forgive Israel every time because I love her. Because I'm the faithful spouse, she's the unfaithful spouse. And the New Testament is exactly the same. That's why Paul refers to the church as the bride of Christ. It's a spousal relationship, not a legal agreement. So we have to put law away. Because love is greater than law. And love is the law. So we, we find, but all of this is reflected in that first, those first chapters of the book of Genesis. It's not actually a story about the creation of the world. De deuterium isn't mentioned once, it doesn't mention quarks or gluons or electrons or anything like that. Not talking about the creation of the universe. 
is talking about the just simply says that God created it, but then everything else symbolically testifies to us about ourselves, what the problem of humanity is, and why humanity is in the mess it is, and how we need a redeemer to come and bring us out of this. We constantly separate ourselves from God. We constantly fall into idolatries. We constantly misunderstand everything that God has taught me. And it's misinterpreted time and time again, even by the writers of the Old Testament, who didn't understand. And the prophets tried to correct it. But uh, people didn't, you know, as Christ says, oh yeah, well, we sent the prophets to tell you, but you killed them all, or drove them out, uh, or, you know, persecuted them. Zachary, the father of John the Baptist, was killed in, in the holy place. And uh, the, many of the Old Testament prophets Look at Prophet Elias, who had to flee and hide in the cave of Sapsas and be fed by the ravens. And the whole country practically were trying to kill him. But all of these things, uh, ultimately, the message was simple, and everybody made it so complex and so contorted. The message was simple. This is a spousal relationship. This is a love, love between God and the holy people. Now, love between God and the people of God, the church. So we're not saved as individuals, but the community itself, the whole community of the church, God has a spousal relationship with. Uh, and this is very important for us because we cannot be really the followers of Christ by keeping laws, rules, and regulations. You know, such customs that are given to us, like the 40-day fast or the fasting periods. Remember, those are given as a gift to us. God doesn't need that. But we need it. First of all, when we begin to keep Great Lent, it's like a declaration of independence from the world. We're, we're saying we reject the standards of the world and we accept a higher standard. And fasting teaches us self-control and self-discipline because it requires self-discipline and self-control in order to do it. And why do we have the self-control and self-discipline? Well, of course, because our life will be better because of it, but because in that time we're really going to focus ourselves on Christ. And that requires self-discipline and self-control. So in, in the Lenten periods, in the fasting periods, we become far more aware of the presence of Christ and of our relationship. But we also become aware of the fact that we have to change that we have to become a new creature, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And this is uh, a, a part of what all of these things about the church are. But if we kept any of these things just because it's a rule or a law, then we're no better than Cain. We have to do it from the heart, out of love, because this is a spousal relationship, not a legal agreement. You know, that's why we would never say, Oh, Christ is my own personal Savior. I accepted Christ at 1245 on 5th of January, 1942. And therefore, he's now obligated, legally obligated to save me. He has a legal obligation, see, because I feel my legal obligation. But nothing like that, of course, ever existed until the 1800s. That whole idea of Christ as my own personal Savior was invented in the late 1800s. It has nothing to do with the revelation about the church the body of Christ. One Christian is no Christian. We have to have love amongst ourselves. We have to have love as a community. We have to develop unselfish love. And that's one of the sweet mystery of the community itself, the synaxis, the coming together of the people of God to worship. Because it's there in that community that we have the opportunity to begin to work out unselfish love, to have love amongst ourselves, amongst the community. And learn how to work, sort of corral our ego so that we have peace in the whole community to try to struggle against our ego and our self-centeredness and our self-love in the community. And really the, the, the parish, the community, the synaxis of the people of God come together for the agape and worship both. Uh, it, it's, it's because we can develop unselfish love in, in this community. And that's really what we need to do. So anyway, yes. Why God let us to go too far to make all this turmoil? Do we ever going to see the end of it? Yeah, well, this, the, well, probably in the second yeah. coming, you know. <laughs> probably in the second coming. It's, uh, you know, even the laws. Thousands of years yeah. keep going and 
know, rotating well, even, around. Even the, laws, the civil laws that we make, um, the, the, the kind of people who will not follow those laws are people who are consumed by their own ego. Even the civil laws won't be filled by people who are filled with their own ego, the people who think too highly of themselves. You know, when I go, when I go to the prisons, I talk to, uh, especially in the maximum security, or sometimes I, I manage to talk to criminals before they've been arrested <laughs> sometimes, and they're always smarter than everybody else. Everybody's going to get caught, but not me. You know, all these dummies will get caught, but I won't get caught because I'm smarter than all of them. And then the next thing you know, they're in prison. Mm -hmm. But they always, their ego always consumes, always eats them up. And uh, yet we can't be deprived of all freedom either because then if we're deprived of freedom, we have no capacity to love. Because love has to be something that's free. free. There has to be a freedom to it. And compulsion or coercion isn't any good. You know, this is one thing we discussed with, uh, I discussed with some of the uh, Islamic students in, in Turkey because they had a teacher, Said Nursi, who was opposed to political Islam. And he said, what good is it to force people to pretend that they believe when they don't? You can't force people to believe. People have to believe from the heart. They said, well, of course. I mean, this is exactly <laughs> the truth. You have to believe from the heart. You know, if, if, uh, if the church had been the way to power in Russia, Stalin would have been in church every Sunday. But that wasn't the way to power. He wouldn't have believed, but he would have been in church every Sunday if that, if that was the path to power. Because that's all he was really interested in. And that's uh, the thing that people keep asking, why aren't we forced to do this, why aren't we forced to do that? And I keep telling some of my evangelical Christian friends, stop trying to bully people into faith. Stop trying to legislate, pass civil legislation to force people in, to pretend they have faith, to pretend they believe. Leave it alone. Within the church we teach what's proper. Civil society takes care of itself. We have no right to try to pass our doctrines and dogmas into civil law. But what we have to do is to try to win people or convince people, not just through reason, because reason, I mean, the whole world is not constructed in anything that we can reason out. I mean, just try to take a look at what holds quarks together in a, in a you know, uh, quantum mechanics, physics is unreasonable by our standards. Everything's unreasonable by our standards. So it's not just by reason, it's also by demonstrating a life that's consistent with what we're trying to teach people. And that's one of the big gaps. Everybody wants to preach about Jesus Christ, but they want to lace it with a sermon about hatred, about malice, about who God hates, about who God doesn't like, about who's going to hell. That's, why should people want that? Why should anybody pay attention to that? You know, that's not what Christ taught, and that's not what the gospel teaches, and that's not what we're trying to convey. So what we have to do is try to obey what we're saying ourselves. Try to have an unselfish love. Try to uh, embrace people. Try to uh, uh, show some kind of love and compassion and forgiveness and openness toward other people. You can't say, uh, you know, we went through that whole long period, and not just in the United States, we have problems too. Uh, when uh, Christians, usually Southern Baptists, would go out and burn down a nigger church. Most people were praying to God, they were singing the same hymns, they were reading the same Bible, but they were black, so he'd go burn their church down. And they were mostly Baptist as well. So, and, and this was supposed to be preaching the gospel in some way. You know, we always find someone to hate and to persecute. That's what Hitler did, that's how he got power. You know, hating the Jews is not uh, useful either. And uh, or hating Muslims or hating Arabs or hating anybody. We have to embrace everyone as an equal human being. And if we can do that with some love and clarity in our hearts and openness, then we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there isn't any other way to actually proclaim that gospel. And some people think it's only by instilling fear in people that they will... Um, uh, come to Christianity, and I know they do that in Russia quite a bit too, you know, with all this goofy nonsense about toll houses and things like that. 
what they're doing is they're trying, they think that fear is a way to make people worship God. Fear is a way to make people hate God. And even if they don't become atheists, they don't want to worship God because they hate him. It's not that they don't believe, it's that they despise him because he's out to get them. He's a constant threat to them. He wants to hurt them. So why should you worship somebody like that, you know? Uh, that's that's part of the problem. Yeah. Anybody else have a yeah? Uh, do babies live in paradise? Yeah. yeah. In fact, when a when a when an infant dies, we have the funeral service for an infant is the funeral service for a saint, not for for somebody who's pure, completely pure. Um, I hope. I mean, children are not innocent after the first week completely, because they learned how to manipulate you already, you know. Uh, you know, they, <laughs> yeah, they learned, well, but they have to, it's, it's a matter of survival, though, for them, that's a difference. You know, if children cry and scream, and somebody says, oh, that proves that people are born depraved because children cry, come on, they don't have any other way to communicate. Yeah. That's the way they'll communicate, it's a valid that's form correct. of communication for an infant. <laughs> Because they don't have any other way. Right, and they, they, you, you can, but after a while, a parent can tell, are they crying because they're hungry? Are they crying oh. because they need their diaper changed? Are they crying because Something they need wrong. reassurance and need you to be there so they can see you? You can, you can, you can tell what they're the crying. You can learn to interpret that fairly early. So it's a valid form of communication for them. But they, they have to you know, manipulate you some way. I mean, it doesn't take kids long, long to find out that it's survival of the cutest. It's not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the cutest. And uh, so, that, uh, uh, but, you know, babies, babies and insane people won't have much to worry about. And both have an easier path than everybody else. <laughs> so, anybody else have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I don't want to be asking a stupid question here. Uh, I don't want to be asking a stupid question here, but I'm curious because um, you were talking about about um, how how you know the Bible is not is not a story of of um, the universe and how the universe was created and mm -hmm. how and how you know the earth was created and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Um, is there any relationship to to uh, you know the how how we came to exist um, in terms of you know Science, some truth in there that maybe it's scattered around or something, or uh, or should we look at it more as uh, and completely as as a story about the heart? Well, it, it, it's mostly really a story, story about our struggle, but uh, there, there are the same number of geological epochs as there are days of creation. But stop and think: why would why would uh, God reveal the whole? story of creation, I mean, people then could have understood it even far less than people now. But if you sit down and talk to people about how the universe came into being, I mean, you can talk about a big bang and everybody thinks of boom, you know, and then all of a sudden everything was there, but it's very, very complex. You know, probably in the very beginning after the initial prime singularity exploded, there was nothing but a viscous sea of quarks and gluons or something, and then or how they formed into mostly triplets, you know. But it's important that they formed into triplets, the proper triplets, so up quarks and down quarks, you know. The spin one third and uh, spin minus, spin two thirds and spin minus one third. All this is important. So you're going to sit there and tell a bunch of <laughs> Hebrews wandering in the desert, uh, you know, uh, you combine quarks that have spin plus two thirds and spin minus one third, so you end up with spin one third because of the combination. And, okay, I mean, really. Uh, I mean, most people today can't understand, so why would, why would that be useful? It wouldn't be useful at all. Uh, even to say how many billion years it all existed, that wouldn't be useful to anybody because that isn't the point. The point is the condition that mankind is in. I mean, why? To show that God loved mankind and he created it, and he's also planning to redeem us in the fullness of time. So. That's what's being revealed to us. This is this concrete reality. The scripture is leading toward the heavenly kingdom and everlasting life, not simply the physical universe. And that's what's being revealed to us. So we, we have to, uh, 
you know, look at uh, look at the two stories, and you always ask them. Oh, so every single word is in, inerrant, really. Then were animals created before man, or was man created before animals? Did God create Adam and Eve at the same time, or this rib story that actually didn't exist in the scripture until the Jews came back from Babylon and they brought it back from Babylon with them? I mean, you, you see why you run into problems when you try to make all that literal. Women can make my, mitochondrial DNA. Men can't have no mitochondrial DNA in, their, in, in what they transmit. Nothing can live without mitochondria. But only women can, can transmit mitochondrial DNA. Men can't. And really, men play a very minor role. You know, up until the 1600s, when they had microscopes, People didn't know that women, that they thought women were simply an incubator for the male sperm. They didn't know that women actually had ovum. So that's why, that's why they, in, in Islam they refer to the woman as the, the man's field. And he can rape his wife anytime he wants because, as they say, you can plow your field anytime you want. Because the woman has no role in this. I mean, it's just male sperm goes in, you know. Uh, they didn't know anything about it. Male sperm is an incomplete cell. It's not even a complete cell. And a lot of the males in, in various species are, are a little more than just a, a parasite on the female in many ways. They're just there to produce genetic variants, variation. See? And really, the, 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 the primary male role in great antiquity was to fertilize the female egg so that there would be variation and the, and the children would be born, you know, weak and frail if, if they just had one set of, you know, DNA. But also to, pr to protect the woman while she was bearing the child. And that's why they're stronger, because somebody had to protect the woman while she was pregnant and bearing children. And, and also to feed, to feed the family. Uh, so we, we, we've got, you know, this story a little bit odd. Female is the default gender. Everybody in this room began life as a female. And you had to be masculinized after, I believe about the sixth week or something, when the, the defeminization of the brain takes place and masculinization takes place in the brain. For if you're an XY chromosome. But sometimes it doesn't even work, and female is the default gender. Sometimes an XY chromosome child is born with a completely female body, although technically they're a male because they're XY chromosome. Because when something goes wrong with the androgen, it reverts to the default, which is female. See? So, uh, but why are we going to tell all this stuff to a bunch of Hebrews wandering around the desert? You know, because that, that's not going to be any useful to anybody. What's useful to us is to know what the human condition is, what causes uh, the problems and woes and sorrow and bloodshed on the face of the earth amongst humans, and what the solution is, even though we're not going to manage that solution until the second coming of Christ. So that's really what, what these stories are about, you know. But uh, it's just like the story of Jonah. I mean, we know very well that uh, Nineveh never repented in sackcloth and ashes, and they never accepted the uh, Hebrew God. I mean, we know the history of Nineveh very well. But what else, what is there to the story other than that? And why is the sign of Jonah the only sign that people will be given? Because not just about the three days in the whale. It's also the fact that at the time Israel had become so particularist that they, they wouldn't allow anybody else to come to worship God. If you weren't born there, you weren't welcome. So they weren't any, any more, they were no longer disciples. They were no longer spreading the gospel of the one God who created the heavens and the earth. And God comes tells Jonah to what? Go to the most hated people on the face of the earth because the Ninevites were hated by everyone. In fact, when Nineveh finally fell, one of the chroniclers says, uh, and I think in, in Babylon it also say, that when, Bab when Nineveh fell, the whole earth sighed a sigh of relief. It was hated so much. So God says, go to the most hated people on the face of the earth and tell them I love them. And also, Say, the gospel is not just for you. The gospel is for other nations. I'll call a nation that are not was not my nation. I'll call the people who are not my people. So, or Jonah to refuse to go, first of all because they were hated, but also because they weren't Jews. They weren't of Israel. 
And God would say, no, this is for all mankind. And you might hate them, but I love them. And I want them to return. You know, I want them to come in and be saved. So there's several things like that in the Old Testament, in these stories, that we have to look beyond what seems on the surface and see what's actually there. Because there's no way that you could explain all these things to people living today. You couldn't explain any of these things. I mean, they, they wouldn't grasp it. So how much less would they grasp it in, in the most ancient times? So what was necessary was told, what wasn't necessary wasn't. The rest was left for us to discover in it, really. So that's, uh, anyway, anybody else have any questions? So, okay, it is me. Blessed and most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption thou gavest birth to God the Word, through Theotokos we magnify thee. Glory to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, let me complain. God is with us by grace and love for mankind always, now and ever, and unto ages of ages.